So one of the alternatives is to try to make the fossil fuels themselves basically carbon neutral by sequestering the carbon. And you, you have to capture the carbon from production uh, and either bury it in the ground, bury it in the deep ocean, or as we talked about, in, in, increase uh, uptake by biological sources of the carbon. Um, now before you do that, this is something which um, doesn't get talked about a lot for carbon sequestration, but it, it is expensive. Um, first of all, it's hopeless to capture it except at stationary sources. You're not going to car you're not going to put a big carbon sequestration thing on your car, right? So you, or your truck. So you're, you're not going to be able to do it anywhere except stationary sources. And this gives you an idea of where the big stationary emissions of carbon are all over the world, basically from, from power plants. Um, and what you have to do is you have to capture the carbon dioxide before it hits the flu of the power plant. The cost of that is $18 to $72 per metric ton of carbon dioxide. Uh, so for a 50 megawatt power plant producing about uh, 4.3 million tons a year, that gives an added cost of basically 2 to 8 cents per kilowatt hour. You're going to lose some efficiency in your power plant to do the work for capture. That's at the order of 1 cent per kilowatt hour. You've got a pipeline of carbon dioxide, which adds another cent per kilowatt hour. So right off the bat, independent of whatever sequestration method you're using, you're going to add four to ten cents per U.S. cents per kilowatt hour to the price of your electricity. Uh, in the case of coal, that would that would add a huge amount of uh, cost to the coal burning plants because right now coal gets charged about four cents a kilowatt hour uh, in operation in the United States. Um, now let's see. Um, what about the, the biggest single place, uh, land-based at least, is, is porous rock formations. The estimate are that globally there's a, you can store the order of 300 to 10,000 gigatons, metric tons, of uh, carbon in the form of carbon dioxide in porous rock formations. Now the annual emissions rise is about um, uh, 8 gigatons uh, per year. That's not all from power plants, of course. There's some of that with transportation. Um, but that, that would be the average uh, rise going into the future, I should say. So that would allow you to store somewhere between 40 to 1,500 years of carbon dioxide in these porous rock formations uh, in the ground. Um, now, there, there is a concern. You'll have a rise in pressure in the ground, which could trigger seismic events. It could conflict with mineral or gas extraction in that vicinity. If you pump it into existing and depleted oil wells, you can actually get enhanced uh, recovery of oil and gas from those wells. Um, it could pollute potable water with uh, carbonic acid. Um, there's also a concern about the escape of carbon dioxide. I think this is the biggest concern that everybody has, is could you have gradual escape of carbon dioxide, which happens in Mammoth Lakes in California, for example, or catastrophic uh, release of carbon dioxide, which happened, for example, in 1986 at Lake Nios in Cameroon. This is just naturally uh, occurring carbon dioxide, basically from volcanic activity. In the Mammoth Lakes area of California, the gradual leak basically kills off uh, plant life in the vicinity of, of the carbon dioxide leak. And they tell you with signs up there that you shouldn't go and uh, walk your pets in this vicinity because they might suffocate. Um, not you, but the pets. Um, and then this is, um, oh, okay, sorry. Oh, okay. And then this is Lake Nios, which was, there was carbon dioxide in the, in the silt of Lake Nios in Cameroon which was roiled after the Slimnik eruption in, 18, uh, in 1986, and again, about 1,700 people were killed when that carbon dioxide went away from the lake down to some villages in Cameroon. So doing this carbon dioxide sequestration represents another kind of giant experiment that would be uh, uncontrolled. You could store it in depleted ass, uh, gas or oil fields. You can store about 100 gigatons of carbon dioxide there. And again, that could enhance recovery of oil and gas from existing wells, but again, the issue is leakage. You can store it in coal beds where it actually uh, can displace uh, recoverable methane from the coal beds, and carbon dioxide has a high affinity to be stored on the, on the coal bed. It's an animator scale fractures in the coal. But again, sequestration represents a huge scale experiment on top of our existing fossil fuel. We may have to use sequestration or carbon capture in some form to go forward and reduce the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, but it's, it's a huge experiment. Uh, nuclear power. Um, one attractive feature of nuclear power that every physicist loves is that you get huge amounts of energy from small amounts of material. And that means nuclear power is intrinsically safer in the sense of industrial accidents because there's less material, so there's less transportation, there's less mining, you don't have to uh, expose as many people to potentially catastrophic risks, um, uh, accidents, industrial accidents. 
That's excluding potential catastrophes of nuclear plants themselves. Now, uh, fusion, I won't say anything more about fusion except that when I was a little kid, basically it was a, a fabulous source of potentially unlimited energy that was 30 to 40 years away. And that brings me to the current age where it still looks like it's 30 to 40 years away. Um, now, one little known secret uh, about nuclear power is that if you don't do breeder reactors, which convert the abundant isotope of uranium to plutonium by neutron capture, uranium-based nuclear power is actually very short in lifetime. At the current uh, uh, 10 terawatt, order 10 terawatt energy demand worldwide, uh, if we got all of that from nuclear power, then the land-based resources of uranium would last us about a year. So uh, we're stretching that out because we're consuming only about 10 to 20 percent of our electricity from nuclear power. But if we jack up the nuclear production, we're not going to have, a, and it's only uranium-based, we're not going to have enough to go around unless we build breeder reactors. There's no commercial breeder reactor out there right now. Uh, extraction of uh, needed uranium-235 from, from seawater would probably require tens of trillions of dollars if you go away from the land-based extraction. So it would get pretty expensive quickly to get it from the, from the seawater. Yeah, um, is aqueous thing really very prone to nuclear proliferation? That's the reason they weren't built in the United oh, States, okay. yeah, because you're getting all this plutonium out. And uh, the, 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 uh, pluton all, all the plutonium would be used for nuclear weapons. So, yeah, that's why, that's why Carter killed the breeder program in the United States and killed even reprocessing in the United States in the 1970s, right? Uh, reprocessing does go on in most other countries, though, for example. But that's still not breeding. That's just capturing what plutonium you have from spin fuel rods. Um, in the United States, the cost is probably lower in France, but it, for example, but the cost of nuclear power is also high. This has actually been the biggest reason why there's been no new nuclear plants built in the States for the last 30 years. The cost is about 11 cents per kilowatt hour versus 6 cents for wind, 4 cents for coal. Uh, and one re the biggest reason is the capital costs of nuclear power. Um, the operation costs are in principle cheap. They're about two cents per kilowatt hour, but the capital cost when you feed it in over the lifetime of the plant makes that power very expensive by comparison to other forms. In the United States, there's a huge NIMBY problem, not in my backyard, because virtually, uh, there's virtually no U.S. storage of low-level waste, just the contaminated parts uh, associated with nuclear power, or high-level waste, which are the spent fuel rods. Uh, there's supposed to be a high-level waste storage facility built at Yucca Mountain, or high-level waste dump at Yucca Mountain, but the, the Senate Majority Leader, Harry Reid, is from Nevada, and he's basically refusing to let this happen. Most Nevada politicians are dead set against it. Uh, so it's not built, and the odds are it won't be. So right now, all those spent fuel rods are sitting in pools um, at the nuclear sites themselves. Um, there is an interesting alternative, which is to build thorium uh, reactors. Uh, thorium is far more abundant than uranium. Uh, you can breed uh, 232 thorium to produce fissile uh, 233 uranium, and it's, it's a very high level of conversion, about 90% of thorium to uranium by neutron capture. Um, you make a huge amount less of transuranic material with uh, thorium-based reactors. And, for example, in Australia, there's a huge amount of thorium available. Um, comparable numbers in other countries like India, somewhat less than the United States. But there's a lot of thorium out there. And it, unlike uranium, where only the 0.3% the that's fissile contributes to the energy, all of the thorium basically contributes to the energy. Um, here's a little bit of comment about the abundance. I do think it's probably worth exploring thorium-based reactors, and that's why I'm spending a little time on it. Um, the crustal abundance of uranium is about 2.7 milligrams per, per kilogram of crustal material, but again, a small portion of that is, is fissile. And the oceanic abundance is about 3.2 times 10 to the third milligram, minus 3 milligrams per liter, uh, but again, a small amount of that is, is fissile. Um, there's three times more thorium per kilogram of crustal material, and again, nearly all of that goes to fissile uh, material. There is um, a comparable amount of, of thorium that can go to fissile material, well, it's order, within an order of magnitude of the uranium out of the oceans, but with the thorium, basically, you don't have to go to the oceans, you can extract it from the crust from thorium mining. Um, and this is just an overview of uranium versus thorium reactors from wire. There's sort of two predominant models of thorium-based reactors. Um, one is the seed and blanket reactor, which requires both uranium and thorium, and one is this liquid fluoride reactor, which is basically purely experimental at this point. Uh, 
Uh, the uranium plus thorium reactor requires a comparable amount of raw uranium to thorium for it to work. So in a way, it doesn't really solve the problem um, of the uranium running out. You need, uh, per gigawatt of output, you need about 46 ton, or sorry, 4.6 tons of raw thorium, but you still need 177 tons of raw uranium. You need about 250 tons of uranium um, over here for the uranium-based power plant. The liquid fluoride thorium reactor it just reverses that. You basically need almost uh, no uranium. You need one ton of raw thorium. The annual fuel cost is around 50 to 60 million here, and it's about $10,000 here. Um, and these, these have large footprints. They have 200 to 300,000 square foot footprints versus about a 2,000 to 3,000 square foot footprint here with no need for a buffer zone around cities. At least that's the claim. But here you need a, a low density population zone around each one of these kinds of plants. And the uranium uh, thorium plant, basically you have a seed fuel of enriched uranium in the middle with a blanket fuel on the outside, a thorium-uranium mix that captures the neutrons and turns the thorium into uh, uh, plutonium, or sorry, into uranium, or the uranium-233 fissions. And this is, um, even though uranium-233 is fissile, you produce a lot of uranium-232. That's a very nasty uh, radioactive uh, fuel which actually discourages um, uh, pro 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 proliferation. Uh, you swap the, the seed fuel frequently, and you keep the fuel blanket long term as your main uh, source of, of fission. Uh, and the claim is that compared to conventional uranium plants, you reduce the, the radiotoxicity by 90% over a, a 200 to 300 year uh, span of running such plants. In the liquid salt reactor, basically you have uh, uh, some fissile material in the core, and you keep feeding a salt of, of liquid thorium um, in uh, thorium compound in, inside here, um, which absorbs the radiation, forms new fuel that's gradually fed into the, to the core. If there turns out to be a problem here, you can uh, uh, melt a frozen plug of salt and you can basically uh, stop the, 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 the reaction process. And then you do the usual sort of heat exchangers and so on out here. This is one which looks very promising, although there's uh, concerns here about corrosion inside the liquid core uh, you know, corroding the vessel that holds all this that Steve Chu has noted, for example. But this looks like a very promising area of, of research and probably um, should be explored. Uh, to me, this looks like the most promising direction in nuclear power. Um, hydroelectric, this is all I'm going to say. Uh, right now, there's probably technically feasible about 1.6 terawatts of hydroelectric power, economically available about 0.9 terawatts, and we've already got installed about 0.6 terawatts. There's not much more to get hydroelectric. Um, this is you know, two of the famous dams built in the 30s in the United States, Hoover Dam and Grand Coulee Dam. And this is the famous Three Gorges Dam in China. We, we uh, definitely don't produce uh, um, uh, greenhouse gases from, from these unless they um, uh, you know, swamp forests and therefore swamp the, the, the carbon storage capacity in the forests. But we basically tapped out all the power we're going to get from, from hydroelectric. There's not much more to gain from hydroelectric. So uh, this is something which actually Nate Lewis tends to downplay, uh, but which looks like it could be a huge source of um, useful energy, and that's deep geothermal or enhanced geothermal. And uh, the basic idea is that you, um, you, you use the temperature differences between the hot basement rock and the surface in order to, to um, heat steam up and drive generators. And the, the process is to you go you, you do deep drilling um, uh, down to the hot basement rock. You then uh, uh, inject water into the well, produce um, fracture zones where uh, the water goes out to the hot basement rock, and then the most efficient means is to inject on one side and heat on the other side. So you, you inject this hot water, it runs over the rock, you collect the steam over here, and you drive a turbine over this way. Um, how big is the potential capacity for deep geothermal? Well, this is just for the US, but you can idea the numbers. Um, the total U.S. energy consumption in 2005 was 100 um, uh, e-joules, that is 10 to the 18th uh, joules, so 10 to the 20th joules in the United States. The capacity at a 2% conservative estimate in this MIT study is about uh, 2.8 times 10 to the 5th uh, e-joules. Uh, at the high end, you get about 5.6 times 10 to the 4th e-joules, orders of magnitude higher than this energy consumption right here. Uh, and the amount of stored thermal energy in place is, is really quite enormous. So there's a, there's a huge potential here. There, there are, of course, potential consequences, but 
There's no greenhouse gases produced in this, apart from what you might use in transporting out some of the material. You've got to go to these hot zones, which are basically away from um, plates, away from, from plates. And so, for example, there's hot zones all across the western United States. There's a hot zone up in the Dakotas. There's a, a one that's being considered up in New Hampshire, up here. And um, that's the areas in red right here. And then you um, have the following concerns, that the, the rock fracturing impact could, could affect the local environment. You can also trigger seismic events. They shut down a plant in uh, Basel, Switzerland, a test plant in Basel, Switzerland, because it triggered a pretty minor earthquake, but it did trigger an earthquake that scared people around Basel. Uh, basically, uh, there was an article in Nature recently which argues that this is an intrinsic aspect of geothermal plants and you just have to let the community know that there could be some minor seismic events associated with them. Um, there's a finite lifetime for the plant. It may be as little as five years of usefulness because of the damage you do uh, underground to that particular fracture system so that you can only sort of run the plant for a finite lifetime. And there are, there are costs uh, to it in terms of the drilling. You may need some, some breakthrough in deep rock drilling in order to, to really um, exploit this. Um, but here are some cost estimates of the electricity produced from this MIT report. For example, uh, these are six different parts of the United States. Clear Lake, which is close to Davis, California, for example. A couple of places in Montana, Oregon, Idaho, and then this place back east in, in New Hampshire. Um, the depth that you have to go to um, uh, is of the order of ranges from uh, five to seven kilometers in these different places. The initial uh, production of electricity would give you these kinds of costs. These are two different economic models for the production of electricity. So the initial cost would be relatively high, uh, 30 cents per kilowatt hour, 22 cents per kilowatt hour, much more here in, in New Hampshire. But as you get to a, being a mature technology so that you can um, do a better job with it, those costs drop down into being competitive with existing um, electricity production in the United States, at least in the western United States, and even not terrible, a little high, but not terrible in, in this one place in the eastern United States. So geothermal actually looks like a, a, a huge potential um, place of um, energy production with some problems. Every single one of these um, sources of alternative energy has problems, but with some problems. Another thing is wind energy. Uh, and. Um, I actually, again, disagree with Nate Lewis on this. I think there's quite a bit of wind capacity out there. Um, and, and the other thing about wind energy is that currently wind energy is competitive with other forms of electrical energy generation. So uh, there was a 2005 study um, done by this group which concluded that there's of the order of uh, uh, 72 terawatts of wind energy available, um, surface wind energy available. And um, uh, that's, that's large, that's about five times uh, uh, U.S. energy usage, or sorry, world energy usage right now. Um, so there's, there's plenty of wind energy available. And wind energy installation has been growing. This shows you the cumulative installed wind energy capacity right here. Uh, this shows you the annual installed capacity right here. It's been growing at a high percentage rate of the order of 20 to 30 percent over a number of, of years. Um, and in terms of wind energy capacity, the single biggest capacity is still uh, the cumulative capacity is still the United States, but, uh, but Germany and China are quite large. And um, in terms of the installed capacity in the last year, China had the biggest installed capacity in the last year with the U.S. close behind. Um, so this gives you an idea of, of who's building wind plants. And one of the biggest producers of wind plants actually is Denmark, which is you know, this tiny little sliver over here, but they, they produce a lot of wind plants for other countries. And this is just giving you an idea about the cost of wind energy coming down, um, again, in, in uh, the range of being very competitive. It's already competitive, at least if you build large wind farms right now. Um, there are hazards. The windmills kill birds, especially raptors like hawks and eagles. Um, the, uh, the impact is probably higher on, on raptors. Um, now, it's true that these projections of bird kills are, are based upon older uh, windmill designs. For example, Altamont House in California, not too far from Davis, is a really bad player here. A lot of hawks and eagles have been killed at Altamont Pass, but the post-2000 windmills seem to be better for birds. Uh, windmills are visual pollution. This was uh, what stopped this uh, wind farm being, for a long time, this wind farm being approved, which is off the coast of Cape Cod, Nantucket, and Martha's Vineyard. It was opposed by the Kennedys, uh, the Kennedy family, including Robert Kennedy Jr., who's an environmentalist. 
Um, and in fact, if you take a look at the visualization of what uh, the wind farm looks like from the closest land to the wind farm, you can't see it. But you just can't even see it. But there was opposition to this wind farm. This was actually just approved the same week, I believe, that deep, the Deepwater Horizon rig blew up. That's when the uh, Department of Interior approved this wind farm off the coast of Massachusetts. Um, for people who live clo too close to the windmills, there's some claims of vibroacoustic disease, which maybe can cause epilepsy, cancer, etc. But I think that's easy to solve. You just don't build a house right next to a giant windmill. Um, now, this is another intriguing idea that's getting a lot more uh, traction. There's a large number of patents out there for this. And that's basically wind kites or high altitude wind uh, generators, where you float the generators up into, into the jet stream. The wind energy goes like one half times the air density times VW cubed, the available wind energy per the wind power per unit area. Uh, if you go to the high atmosphere, like around 10 kilometers up, the density is pretty low, but the wind speeds are very high, and the wind speeds wind up winning out over the, the density. Um, the estimate is that the, the power uh, dissipation in the jet stream available is about 10 to the 15th watts, where of course we're demanding about 10 to the 13th watts. So we're well below the, the power demand in the, the jet stream. Um, here's a couple of papers on this um, if you want to look them up. But this is pretty intriguing from one of these papers. Um, this is now showing you um, the, uh, uh, the percentage of the time that wind speeds, this, you can, hopefully you can see the, the, the map of the Earth down here. This is showing you the percentage of time that wind speeds kind of down close to the surface at 1,000 meters. The percentage of the time, 50% uh, of the time, for example, if you see the green here, 50% of the time those wind speeds exceeded 10, uh, 10 kilometers per second. Uh, or, I'm sorry, the wind energy, excuse me, exceeded uh, uh, 10 kilo kilowatts per meter squared. Um, uh, this is now when it's 68% of the time you see that. This is 95% of the time you see that. So the only place where you sort of get 95% uh, uh, of the time close to the surface is down in this band in the southern hemisphere, where of course there's, there's really no land to break up the wind flow down there. But if you go up to 10 kilometers, the picture changes dramatically. For example, here above New York State, half the time you get wind speeds up into this high, uh, this high wind energy density region. And even at 68% of the time, still above New York State, you get these high uh, energy densities in the wind. So, for example, uh, for ground-based wind in the United States, most of the ground-based wind would be good to, to uh, extract in the either just offshore or huge stretches of the Great Plains states. But for these wind kites, New York State could be sort of the Saudi Arabia of wind kite uh, energy in the United States. Well, maybe not Saudi, maybe the Texas of wind kite energy in the United States. So this is another intriguing um, uh, renewable um, way to, to get energy. And of course, the big problem is then how do you get the power back down? How do you tether the kites and how do you get the power back down to Earth? But it, it looks pretty, pretty exciting as an extension of wind energy. So I think there's actually plenty of energy in wind. Um, and it's just a matter of um, if we want to go that particular way uh, for windmills. Now, the single biggest uh, power source, of course, uh, overall is um, solar energy. And that's the focus of the meeting um, that starts on Wednesday. Um, the amount of solar energy actually striking the Earth is enormous. It's, it's 1.2 times 10 to the fifth terawatts uh, over the, the whole Earth's surface. And the energy, in fact, in one hour of sunlight is, um, uh, let's see, would be, well, it's enough to, it, it's a huge amount of energy in just one hour of sunlight coming down on, on the Earth. Um, Practically, uh, if you thought of extracting with photovoltaics at about 10% efficiency, you could probably extract about 600 terawatts of energy from, from the sun. And 600 terawatts, of course, is um, up by a factor of um, about 50 from where we're at right now in global energy consumption. Um, so depending upon the land fraction you use, you can easily get into this ballpark of 50 to 1500 terawatts. So there's a huge amount of energy available from the sun. It's absolutely the, the biggest single source of, of energy um, available. And uh, you know, this I brought from, from Dave Lewis, but if you take areas the size of these boxes, each one of these boxes could generate, uh, with you know, assuming 10% photovoltaic conversion efficiency, each one of these boxes could generate 3.3 terawatts of photovoltaic energy. Uh, you put a box here in Australia, Saudi Arabia, China, Africa, South America, North America. So there's 20 terawatts right there with no sweat. Just this small amount of land area. Uh, now obviously you wouldn't necessarily concentrate it all in Arizona, although with some of the crazy laws they've been doing recently, maybe not a bad idea. But, um, 
But anyways, the point is, with relatively small amounts of land area, you can easily extract all the energy that, 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 you, that you need to, to run things. Um, we know that um, the, the primary model for, for these photovoltaics right now, of course, is silicon-based photovoltaics with NP junctions, where the, the light shines in at the junction. You have a thinner region doped here and a thicker region down below. The light shines in at the junction region, and you'll get um, particles flowing one way and holes flowing uh, the other way, but giving currents in the same net direction to drive a light pole or a toaster or whatever you're driving. Um, and uh, uh, that's the, the standard model, and that's, that's what's being used for most photovoltaics commercially produced right now. And what drives, what limits the efficiency of those photovoltaics goes back to this um, famous paper, well, physically what limits it is that the effect described in this famous paper by Shockley and Kiesner uh, about 50 years ago. Basically, the idea is that uh, you use the, the, the black body theory, you essentially integrate the, the black body radiation available from the gap, the energy gap up to infinity, divided by that black body radiation um, incident, and that basically gives you the, the, the maximum kind of efficiency as a function of the, the gap of the photovoltaic um, cell. So XG is the, uh, here is the ratio, uh, let's see, XG is basically the ratio of the peak of the black body spectrum to, to the, um, sorry, the gap energy to the peak of the black body spectrum, right? So um, the, the peak efficiency that you get is, is, uh, is up here at about um, 30%. The peak efficiency you can get from, from a, a single particle hole pair creation photovoltaic is about, is about 50%. And the best peaks are at about, for gap energy, which is about two times the black body temperature of the sun, silicon happens to sit in there, although it's an indirect gap material, but silicon happens to sit in there, so it, it can get up to an efficiency of about 25% uh, or so uh, in practice. What about photovoltaic economics uh, for silicon-based photovoltaics? Um, well, there has been an um, a economy of scale. This is coming from Enrel, actually. There has been an economy of scale with photovoltaics that lasted up until basically uh, this decade, where uh, the more experience we had in producing the photovoltaics, the more the, the price uh, dropped. So this is actually a log plot of price per watt over here, and this is time here. So there was an exponential decrease characteristic of these kinds of economies of scale, and then it sort of leveled out. And the physical event that happened here, as many of you probably know, is that uh, at this point, all of that silicon that was being used in those chips, polycrystal or single crystal silicon that was being used in those uh, photovoltaics, was waste uh, silicon from the chip industry that didn't meet the standards you need for, um, for chips, but it was perfectly fine for, for photovoltaics. Over here, basically photovoltaic production becomes comparable to and exceeds chip production, so now all of a sudden you have to change your, uh, your sourcing of silicon for, for the chips. And um, this now shows you a little bit more, more detail in the last decade that uh, now the price per installed watt of photovoltaic power is in the ballpark of about a dollar, close to about two dollars, maybe dollar seventy-five, and it may go down to about a dollar forty um, in the next few years. So we're, we're, we're sort of sitting right in here in this fairly uh, flat portion of that cost curve. Uh, but the installation of photovoltaics, which is illustrated by these, this bar chart right here, the installation and the demand for photovoltaics keeps, keeps going up. Even still, in California at least, I don't know how you do down here, but the best price per kilowatt hour you can get down uh, in California is about 20 cents per kilowatt hour uh, due to the large upfront costs of the photovoltaics. So uh, silicon photovoltaics have a lot of advantages and, and disadvantages. Um, a real um, advantage of the silicon photovoltaics is that it's, it's you know, certainly silicon is a well understood technology. There's an abundant supply of silicon. We're not going to easily run out of silicon. And of course, these silicon photovoltaics are very stable. They can last for decades out of the environment. But a con is that there's lots of water energy and processing. And as we get huge amounts of silicon in photovoltaics, that's only going to go up. They still are net energy producers, but it, it, it's costly in terms of the production. There are toxic byproducts from the cleaning solvents, from some of the dopants, and so on. Uh, so that um, in uh, from chip, old chip production in Silicon Valley, there's some, some toxic waste sites in Silicon Valley that are very bad. We're close to the maximum efficiency now for conventional silicon photovoltaics. And as I mentioned, it's, a, it's an indirect gap, uh, gap semiconductor. You could do better with direct gap semiconductors, even in this um, technology. 
So at least there are reasons to consider alternatives to silicon, uh, and that's of course what the organic the meeting is about starting on Wednesday is organic uh, photovoltaics. And what I want to talk about tomorrow is, is some of the bio-inspired photovoltaics like the Bratzel cells and also uh, solar fuel generation um, that's bio-inspired. And also some about nanoscale ways to beat the, um, the Shockley Keister limit based upon multiple carrier generation in particular. But you can also basically alter the input spectrum and you can uh, try for hot carrier generation. But this is one area, these two areas here, multiple carrier generation and plasmonics alteration of the absorption spectrum um, to make it a, a better spectrum, more tailored to the photovoltaic device. Those seem to be the most promising ways uh, to move forward. And um, so here's this crazy phrase, uh, which is um, perfectly geeky, but I like it. Uh, Tonstoffel, which I got from a colleague at Ohio State, which is just an abbreviation for there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So, um, you know, there's all these caveats as we shift to alternative energy, where our goal is basically to eliminate the carbon, but then we'll get, we'll get new troubles from, from these. For example, as we've already discussed with wind and solar, there's huge capacity for wind and solar, but a, a really big and important problem with wind and solar is, is intermittency, because the wind doesn't blow all the time and, and the sun doesn't shine all the time. So to connect to the grid and maintain stability, the electrical grid, maintain stability on a large scale requires a massive investment in energy buffers and storage on any large grid. You're going to use wind and solar as, as huge sources of energy on your grid. That's it, for example, with hydroelectric, with nuclear, with deep geothermal, with fossil fuel fired power plants, you can run steadily on the grid and that, that uh, provides stability to the grid. Not so with intermittent energy sources. Um, as I've already mentioned, there's existing uh, environmental hazards from wind and photovoltaics. They aren't the same environmental hazards as from um, uh, the fossil fuels, but they're, they're significant environmental hazards that we should, be, we should minimize. Um, if we change in transportation, for example, the hydrogen fuel cell cars, which I haven't discussed here, but, but that's one of the possible routes to the transportation future, where do we get the platinum that's needed for catalysts and anodes and existing fuel cells? There's almost certainly not enough plat platinum available with existing uh, fuel cell technologies. We have to try to do something else there. If we switch to electric cars, which to my mind looks like a more promising route to the future, or to plug in hybrids where the fuel for those hybrids could be biofuel or could be hydrogen, where do we get the lithium from? Maybe from Afghanistan. There's apparently huge uh, sources of lithium in Afghanistan. But the lithium for the, um, the lithium uh, batteries. And, um, Here's a caveat example. The Nissan Leaf has just come out this year. It's an affordable electric car. It's about 25,000 baseline in the United States, uh, US dollars. Um, but if you go to the Nissan website and you check out the, uh, the, the, the range specs for the Nissan Leaf and the charge, um, um, the charge energy that you can store in the batteries of the, of the Nissan Leaf, which are these lithium ion based batteries. Uh, then you use the typical electrical energy breakup in the United States. You compare the Nissan LEAF carbon dioxide emissions to the carbon dioxide emissions from a 30 mile per gallon car, which is the typical car in the United States. They're the same. So you switch to an electric car, meaning you don't pollute the city that you're driving in, uh, but you keep the carbon dioxide emissions exactly the same. And even if you go to California, where we have more natural gas being burned than coal, those carbon dioxide concentrations would make this Nissan LEAF basically equivalent to my Toyota Prius car, which gets about 45 miles per gallon. So we can think that we're switching to something that um, will, will be helpful, but we better be careful. If we don't switch to alternative energy for electricity generation on a large scale, then switching to electric cars and plug-in hybrids won't do us any better, at least for the carbon dioxide emission, we say that that's our main target, than it would to um, um, uh, just keep burning the fossil fuels as they are. Uh, but anyway, that's all I have. Uh, I don't know if you have uh, any other questions or comments, and I'll talk about these alternative photovoltaics tomorrow. It's more efficient uh, right now to do that cheaper, and uh, there, there are advantages and disadvantages. Um, and you don't have to be in a you don't have to have direct sunlight 
uh, to run those, right? You just just getting daily sunlight, you, you can run them. So um, that's definitely, uh, I mean, basically you have to build large power plants, you also get steady power from those. So that's definitely worth worth uh, worth considering. I, I didn't discuss up here, but that's definitely worth considering. Um, and um, it's not flashy, but it's definitely you know, worth considering. I mean, photovoltaics have the advantage that they're distributed, but but they also are, have all these other disadvantages. Yeah. So you're basically talking about a, 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 where you heat up a, like water in, in a solar plant and, and they just turn turbines with that. Yeah. There's one, one or two of those in California now. Oh, you don't need much. I mean, you. Oh, gosh. Um, you. Um, like, at least it depends on where you're at. I mean, if you're in Germany, say, or the Netherlands, or something like that, yeah, then, then photovoltaics, and, because you don't get as much sunlight. But in California, uh, I think for the typical rooftop, it would be like at least a current efficiency. It's like you know, maybe a quarter or a third of your, your rooftop if you want to power everything in the house. So depending on how, how where you're at, it, it doesn't have to take up much space. But there's another reason to jack up the efficiency, right? And the most you can get with, you know, the present photovoltaics, theoretically even, is 29%. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, they, they made some estimates uh, of that in, in the paper on the wind kites. So, um, if you use the wind kites at the existing, uh, the, the claim from the simulation that they did in that paper, if you use the wind kites at the existing, uh, sort of, to, to match the existing demand, it, it should be a minor perturbation on the climate. If you jack that up by an order of magnitude or two, well then you can start affecting the climate. You'd actually do some cooling because you're robbing energy from the atmosphere. Uh, but, but at least that's, what the, now that wasn't seeing how you might affect the wind patterns. But I was asking uh, how would it affect, for example, um, precipitation and ice cover. And it actually would jack up the ice cover some because you'd be taking energy out of the atmosphere. So it's a, it's a separate way to counteract global warming. It could also reduce the number of planes flying at the end. Yeah. We should probably say that they yeah, put them all right over near a city. <laughs> uh, the wind kites are fascinating. It just seems like a really cool idea. Uh, but this is a really dumb question. But so, if fifty percent of the time you don't have the wind to run the wind kites efficiently, do you still have the wind to keep it up there? Do they all fall down? <laughs> yeah, I think there's enough. Uh, I think uh, that's a great question. Yeah, I, I think you. Um, well, I think you actually. I remember I had my students give a talk about this like about four years ago when I first in, in, in the class I teach about the wind kites. And some of them you would actually sort of run up and down like kites, right? You, you run them up when you know the jet stream is going to be pretty high, and then you, you'd ratchet them back down. And some, I think, are more designed to be uh, at least light enough that they probably have a good chance of, of um, staying aloft. But then there's a question about how you get the electricity back down. And so, you know, one of the proposals is like to use uh, carbon nanotube-based uh, cords because they're pretty strong. And you know, but I think so there's still some extension cord. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just a light extension cord. <laughs> So, so, I mean, there's also, it's not completely clear to me how, how well thought out that problem is, but, but there's certainly a huge amount of energy there. And, and basically, you have to, it'd be like where in regions where you have weather balloons, you just have to notify the planes and they just have to swing around the kites, the wind kites. But you wouldn't want to run them over the hole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? I didn't quite get how to extract the wind power in the kite. I mean, oh, you just turn turbines. But then you do have to, through the tether, you have to also run the electricity back down. Oh, sorry, so, the the yeah, so you tether them, and the tether both is, gives you control over the kite like we were just discussing, and it allows you to run the electricity back down to the ground. Oh, yeah. So that, that, that's probably an interesting thing. The wind kite, I mean, wind energy in terms of materials problem, you know, I mean, that, that, that's, it's more of an engineering issue to try to jack up the efficiency sum and so on, and, and you're not going to do much better than what's out there now. But uh, probably there's an interesting material problem for the wind kite in terms of how you get the electricity uh, back and forth in terms of the best way to do that and kind of have lightweight material uh, for doing that. There's not much in the academic literature about, about wind kites. Uh, if, you, if, you do a, if you do a search on Google Scholar, you'll find that most that you find on there are patents for hmm. wind kites. There's very few papers about it. There's a lot of patents. So, so people entrepreneurially are getting excited about this stuff. There actually are a lot of materials, troubles even with the current uh, 
uh, systems because you think about that gearbox, it's supposed to run 30 years without servicing. Oh, yeah. And your car yeah. doesn't do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to belittle it. I just meant that it, it yeah. doesn't necessarily require uh, the, the kinds of it's. Um, I don't mean to belittle engineering at all. It's just that the ICAM focus, I mean, is on sort of new aspects, sort of fundamental aspects of materials. And that's probably not. Um, that aspect of, of wind energy is probably not what we're. What, what we should rightfully, rightfully focus on is very smart people working on those engineering aspects that, 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 that we are. But, but where I can could contribute here, obviously, I think is, is, is on uh, petition of you know, exotic materials, fundamental research on battery materials and things like that, fundamental research on, on novel photovoltaics. Um, but there's some parts of the, of the energy problem, like, like uh, windmills and so on, where we don't really need fundamental breakthroughs, but we do need a lot of great engineering to, to improve. Um, a lot of, of intelligent, really smart people to work on it to improve it. Can we use a photosynthesis for uh, as an alternative source of energy? Well, um, that's an interesting question, because and that's part of the motivation, as some of you probably know from the Gratzel cell, that, that um, you know, already uh, with photosynthesis, you, you take photons and quite efficiently convert that into, in that case, chemical energy. Um, and the problem is that if you try to use the photovoltaic, it's the, the photosynthetic apparatus outside of the plants, it basically is unstable. So Gratzel went, was inspired by that with this alternate route. I'll, I'll talk about that tomorrow, but Gratzel went this alternate route to come up with a potential photovoltaic device which was at least inspired by photosynthesis, but sort of, sometimes they say the temporal separation of charge, which you did photosynthesis work where recombination of particles and holes. I mean, if you go to the, the silicon photovoltaics, you separate the particles and holes. Um, let's see, I guess I lost that. But if you go to the silicon photovoltaics, you separate the particles and holes, of course, spatially. Um, by, the, by the doping profile, you, you allow the particles and holes to separate spatially so they don't recombine. I mean, photosynthesis is sometimes said that you do that temporally because the, the, the back rate for recombination is about uh, six orders of magnitude slower than the forward rate uh, for, for breaking apart the particle. You do separate them spatially as well, but but so that was what Gratzel, that's what inspired Gratzel. But you can't take directly take that photosynthetic apparatus out. And that's also part of the part of the rest of the photosynthetic apparatus is, is, is inspirational for generating fuel. Uh, for example, by looking at the way that the photosystem 2 splits water to potentially generate hydrogen, then um, that's something you know, that people would like to mimic. Uh, that's something people would like to mimic. Oh, just you didn't say much about hydrogen. Yeah, I did. I, I guess one of me. What's your take? I guess I, I used to be really enthusiastic uh, about hydrogen. Uh, it's of course an energy storage medium. It's not uh, an alternative source of energy because you know we have to we have to break up water to get the hydrogen. Um, and you can break up that. You don't have to. I mean, right now, if we did hydrogen, most of it would come from fossil fuels. <laughs> Overall, we'd save some carbon dioxide by converting the. The, by, by reforming the fossil fuels and burning the hydrogen rather than directly burning the fossil fuels, but we still are going to be producing carbon dioxide in that process. But if you produce it by either a nuclear plant or if you produce it from electrolysis, for example, from renewable or by photocatalysis, then you can generate the hydrogen immediately. But then I'm concerned about all the sort of extra pieces you have to put in place for a hydrogen infrastructure. I mean, we have to really get fuel cells. Um, optimized with low-cost materials. We have to deal with how we transfer the hydrogen um, uh, to cars. Um, hydrogen is a potentially dangerous fuel because it ignites quickly, it diffuses quickly, um, and um, so it is a potentially dangerous fuel. Um, and uh, it just seems like there's so many problems to solve. I mean, it's not necessarily too high a cost. There was an estimate in the United States that to put in the infrastructure for hydrogen economy would cost like about um, $300 billion, which I, uh, a few years ago they did this, which was at that time the cost of the war in Iraq, for example, which was an interesting point of comparison, depending on how much you believe that had to do with oil or something like that. But, um, you know, so it's not, it's not expensive, um, but it's uh, still there's so many things we have to do to get it to work. So what I'm more inclined to think of is if we can come up with um, um, either, if we can come up with fuels that are solar generated, or biofuels by, for example, cellulose biofuels combined with plug-in hybrids, then we can solve the range problem for transportation and um, uh, kind of then go for alternative energy for every, every all the electrical pieces. That's, I, I'm kind of more in favor of plug-in hybrids and electric cars at this point than, than hydrogen. 
Okay, I think we better call it uh, quits there. So let's thank Dan again.